Let me start by asking, as you saw the images last night of what happened after the announcement, what, do you, what went through your mind, having been so closely involved with this? It was profound sadness. As I watched this, what should have been a happy day for Darren and for the outcome of the case, the announcement of the grand jury, was all lost. I couldn't watch it and not just feel that I, I felt it so deeply. I wanted to cry. It was awful to watch. Mm. How is Darren Wilson doing? We were with him today for several hours. Um, he's, he's relieved, so there's been this huge weight that's been lifted off of his shoulders. But again, he's watching the same images that I'm watching and that you're standing in, and it, I think it has the same effect upon him as it has upon me. He's been watching it on television. He has. And what he's expressed to us is that it's such a diverse community, and his patent statement is, Ferguson loves Ferguson, and it's, it's tearing him apart watching what's going on in that city. Do you know what happens to him now? I mean, does, does he want to remain a police officer somewhere? Don't think that's ever going to be possible, and I think he understands that, and he'll be looking for a different career going forward. And I will tell you that, again, his whole life was built around being a police officer. It was about service. That's what he wanted to do. And again, there's, there, there are two tragedies in this. The first tragedy is the loss of Michael Brown's life, and that is, I don't care how you stand, I don't care who you are, you can't ignore the fact that a young man died. But the flip side of this is that here's a man who was going to dedicate his life to the service of the community and the community at large, and we've lost that too. There are a number of people who have been looking at, at the, the witness testimony today and said, look, even, even as the prosecutor himself last night was talking about all the contradictory eyewitness testimony, that some people see that and say, well, look, this could have very easily gone to a trial and been left up to a jury to, to decide. If you look at everything, and, and, and again, I heard lots of people complain about the process that McCullough's engaged in. His vision on this from the beginning was put as much in front of the grand jury as I can. Who can complain about that? How can we complain that there's been too, too much, much information? information? Too much information. And here we know that there hasn't been. He's given him everything. So let's start with that. But, but there, as you know, there have been complaints. People have said, well, it was an attempt to overwhelm uh, the, the grand jury, this uh, was a, some of the evidence might have not have been admissible in, in a court of law. But that's not, that doesn't matter in a grand jury. There are no rules of evidence in the grand jury. We don't say, is this admissible? It, yes, it is, so let's give it to the grand jury. You can put anything in front of a grand jury. It can be hearsay. But it is highly unusual the way this was presented to the grand jury. Normally a prosecutor would, uh, would would kind of pick and choose what was presented because the whole idea is just about a probable cause. Here's where I disagree with you. In most cases that go to the grand jury, there's a reason you go. Secrecy is always the key. You go to a grand jury with evidence because you want to keep the names of witnesses private. And in this instance, with all of the threats that have been made, all of these people who needed to come forward, you can't look at what's going on in Ferguson right now and think that the people in Canfield who are witnesses would feel comfortable with their names being out in public. So you go to a grand jury, you have that secrecy so that people can come in and can be confident that their testimony is in fact going to be secret. To me, it made perfect sense, Anderson, that they did it this way. And again, unusual, yes. And as a former prosecutor who had a term in the grand jury, I ran a grand jury, I know how it works. Again, I've never done it this way, but then we've never had a case quite like this. How critical do you think it was for Darren Wilson to be on the stand in front of that grand jury? Um, Absolutely critical. Yeah, I, I, I mean, not just in terms of getting the information across, but just his demeanor, letting Correct. grand jurors actually see him. All those things. You, you, had, you had to listen to him. You had to see him testify. You had to look into his eyes. You had to weigh those words. It was absolutely essential that he testify. Do you believe if publicly people had heard from him earlier on, the perception of this incident may have been different? Yes. And I agree with that. But we couldn't. There was a criminal investigation. And Bob McCullough last night said that the reason that part of the big issue in his case was protecting the integrity of the investigation. Part of where we were was to do just that as well. We didn't want to put his statement out there. We didn't want people to try and disprove it by having other witnesses come forward right. just to say it wasn't true. And we knew that there were lots of witnesses who were making things up. I mean, McCullough said as much, okay? So the integrity of this investigation meant that we couldn't say this publicly. The, the biggest threat to, to Darren Wilson's uh, freedom, essentially, right. was this case as opposed to the federal case. The, the, the standard for a federal case is much different, much, much higher, really, All much right. more difficult. I think right. so. Again, the other part that you have to keep in mind is that to go after him on a civil rights violation, you actually have to show that he intended to violate your civil rights. Well, if you don't even have probable cause in this instance, 
intentional acts are going to be really hard to prove. What happens to Darren Wilson now? I mean, where does he go? I mean, he's start his life over. The life he had as Darren, Darren Wilson, a police officer, is over. So he'll have to find a new way to. How concerned are you about his security? Very, very, very concerned. Very concerned. And again, that's been part of the reason, too, we've had to keep such a low profile for Darren because there are death threats. There are constant death threats. There are bounties that are on his head. So we think about that every time we meet. Every time we meet and we walk out of a building, he looks every way. And you know what? I do that now, too, and so does Jim. I mean, again, we just have to be concerned about those things. Mm -hmm.